Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, crude reality. OPEC has sent a lightning bolt through the energy market with its first oil production pact in eight years. But the deal hammered out in Vienna came at a cost. Find out who's paying the price as the game of oil changes for its biggest players. Also this week, the Trump trade. November's big market moves have implications for the rest of the world. We'll look at whether US President-elect Donald Trump is blowing up the global bond market even before he takes office. And... I'm Adrian Brown in the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou, where the humble bike is making a comeback. Find out why here on Al Jazeera. A make-or-break meeting in Vienna. And then a surprise announcement. This week, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries shocked the world. A deal to remove around 1.2 million barrels of oil a day from global oil supplies was signed. The oil market's been the, in the grip of its worst downturn in a generation. And prior to this meeting, skeptics had said the cartel had lost credibility. So when a deal was struck, the price of Brent crude, the main international benchmark, surged. OPEC demonstrated that it still has the clout to move the market. The pact is also significant because it signals a major U-turn by Saudi Arabia. The kingdom agreed to make the bulk of the cuts... So a big change there in the dynamic within OPEC. Al Jazeera's Nadim Baba reports. As OPEC ministers left the organization's headquarters, the sense of relief was clear. Saudi Arabia, as the largest producer in the group, had agreed to take the biggest hit to its output, trying to drive up the price of crude. Uh, I think it's a good day uh, for the oil markets. It's a good day for the industry. Uh, and uh, in the overall scheme of things, it should be a good day for the global economy. I think it will uh, be a boost to global economic growth. With the agreement reached here on Wednesday, OPEC's hoping it can show that it's able to act as one to push up prices. It's also trying to restore some of the credibility that critics say it's lost over the last few months. The breakthrough came after hours of talks, with the sticking point being whether Iran and Iraq would agree to output cuts. Iran had resisted because it's trying to regain market share lost under international sanctions, while the Baghdad government wanted to guarantee current oil revenues to help it take the fight to ISIL in the north. In the end, Iran agreed to freeze output at around current levels, with Iraq set to cut its production. For its part, Saudi Arabia insisted there should be consensus before it committed to cuts of half a million barrels a day. The Saudis justifiably saying, look, in 2008 we all agreed to cut. We cut, everybody else merely produced on, and we were left holding the baby. So they say, well, you know what, if we cut, we can't be the only ones feeling the pain. With oil prices half what they were two years ago, the pain has been felt most keenly in OPEC countries like Nigeria and Venezuela. They stand to gain from this new deal, but it's dependent on non-members like Russia cutting their own production in the short term. Many countries are prepared to, uh, to cut and the 600,000, uh, we think it is uh, even modest. Out of that, Russia will take uh, 300,000 uh, barrel a day of reduction. So OPEC has its deal and the markets have their good news for now. How far prices can rise and for how long are questions for another day. Nadine Barber reporting. Joining us now from Geneva is Giacomo Luciani, who is a professor and co-director of the Executive Master in Oil and Gas Leadership at the Graduate Institute International and Development Studies in Geneva. Professor, thanks for being with us. Does this pact restore OPEC's credibility? I don't think it's... Uh truly an historic deal. It's a very important deal. Uh, it establishes certain uh, uh, important points. Uh, for example, that Saudi Arabia is not ready to cut uh, unless there is uh, in its production, unless there is uh, support from other OPEC countries and also from non-OPEC countries, all of which has to be uh, confirmed in actual fact and it will need to be confirmed in the coming months. So 
what, Professor, does this mean for Saudi Arabia, which, after all, is making the brunt of the cuts here? Well, for Saudi Arabia, it means, uh, uh, to some extent, an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, shale oil production in the United States is a reality that one has to accept. Uh, when uh, the whole process started, the expectation was that uh, shale oil production in the United States would decline rapidly. It has declined, but not uh, to such a large extent. Uh, it had increased 4 million barrels. It has declined 1 million barrels. So uh, with uh, the cut in OPEC production and no OPEC production, it's likely that prices will firm up a little bit, and this might be sufficient to restore growth in uh, U.S. Uh, shale uh, oil production. And what about non-OPEC members? How much is riding on Russia here? To what extent does Moscow hold the key to ending uh, Nigeria and Venezuela's pain, for example? Well, uh, Moscow is expected to cut 300,000 barrels, which is half of what is expected in total from uh, non-OPEC. But uh, non-OPEC, the rest of non-OPEC is rather vague. Uh, it's not allocated uh, to any specific country. So in essence, uh, I think uh, the role of Russia is very important. And now, in the past, uh, Russia never truly delivered on this kind of deals. And uh, so uh, I think it's legitimate uh, to uh, say, let's wait and see. There's a non-OPEC uh, meeting uh, set to get underway in Doha on Friday. Uh, what do you think we can expect from that meeting? Well, I think uh, that's going to be decisive because there we need to have some uh, uh, truly strong commitments on the part of non-OPEC. And on the part of Russia, it has to be a cut, a cut of 300,000. Until now, Russia has always spoken only of freezing what uh, has been in recent months uh, a record high production. So it's not much of a contribution, is it? How much uh, do you think oil will gain uh, after this move? I mean, how, how high can the price of oil go? Mm. Will, will U.S. shale producers, for example, hinder any potential yes. advance? U.S. shale is one uh, component. The other component really is storage, uh, oil in storage. You have to keep uh, this always in mind. We are not in a situation whereby production goes directly to the market and then to demand. No. In, in the middle, there is a huge amount of storage, of oil in storage, uh, which we don't know exactly how much it is, but it is certainly above 2 billion barrels. Now, uh, if you cut, uh, you know, so to speak, uh, one uh, uh, and a half million barrels, uh, 1.2 from OPEC, another 600,000 uh, from non-OPEC, so 1.8 million barrels coming into uh, this uh, large pool, uh, it's not at all clear that the amount that uh, goes out of the pool will be also reduced. Uh, this is entirely uh, dependent on uh, prices uh, for the next month and prices for uh, the future, uh, four months, six months uh, from now. And uh, that, that very much depends. You know, we, the communique uh, from the OPEC conference speaks of draining uh, this pool of uh, oil in storage, so reducing the pool in, of oil in storage. So it's quite possible that, uh, you know, the, the, the prices uh, for the front month uh, may be reduced, the, the first month may be reduced, but uh, four or five uh, months down the road may not uh, uh, be increased at all. Uh, the front month be increased, but uh, prices in the four or five months uh, ahead may not be increased that much. Uh, it, it is uh, this equilibrium that uh, determines how much oil actually comes into the market. Professor, if the price of oil rises, what impact will that have on, on fragile economic recovery? What, what inflationary pressures are we likely to see? Well, uh, I don't think there will be a significant price rise in the end. Uh, the prices uh, that we see uh, today uh, of the order of just above $50, they may go a little bit higher than that. But as I say, 
there is a huge pool of uh, oil in storage. And if the price goes up, this oil will uh, tend to uh, get out of storage. So it will have a calmerating effect. Okay. Uh, I don't expect prices to uh, go much <coughs> higher than they are uh, today or in the next few days. There is no shortage, uh, no shortage of oil. So the effect on, on the global economy, I expect, will be very modest. Professor, really good to talk to you. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Professor Giacomo Luciani, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Now, some of the world's biggest multinationals were in focus this week. First up, Philip Morris International, the maker of Marlboro cigarettes. Its CEO said in an interview that he wants the group to effectively give up cigarettes. However, that statement was made on the same day that the company launched a new e-cigarette product in the UK, which of course it wants to market as a healthier product. And Nestle, the world's largest processed food and drinks company, also had something to say. Its scientists claim to have discovered a top secret process to reduce sugar content in chocolate. The confectionery maker is about to file a patent for what it says is a first for the industry. Currently, a two finger Nestle Kit Kat bar contains at least 10 grams of sugar. And Amnesty International is demanding firms like Nestle tell its customers if its products have links to a palm oil producer operating in Indonesia, all because of a damning new report. Amnesty claims palm oil, from a company called Wilmar, uses child labour on its plantation in Indonesia. This is the company that supplies palm oil to some of the world's biggest cosmetic and processed food brands, brands that are stocked in supermarkets all over the globe. Still to come on Counting the Cost, a trip to Timbuktu used to be on the to-do list for tourists in Northern Mali. We'll look at why the tourism industry there has dried up and how the ancient centre of learning is slowly turning to dust. The Hollywood producer behind Suicide Squad has been named US Treasury Secretary. Yes, you heard that right. Stephen Mnuchin is also a veteran of one of Wall Street's most powerful firms, Goldman Sachs. As the U.S. president's top economic advisor, Mnuchin will be a key player in carrying out Trump's pledges to slash taxes. Our first priority is going to be the tax plan, and the tax plan has both the corporate aspects to it, lowering corporate taxes so we make U.S. companies the most competitive in the world, making sure we repatriate trillions of dollars back to the United States, and the personal income taxes, where we're going to have the most significant middle income tax cut since Reagan. Uh, we're going to incorporate the child care program. So this is, this is going to be a tr tremendous boon to the economy. Well, ever since Donald Trump became president-elect of the world's biggest economy, the global bond market has taken a hammering. Now, the main reason the bond market has taken fright is because, as we've just heard, fiscal policy could be used for the first time in years in the US. And Trump's likely to cut tax and boost government spending by borrowing more. And as a result, people are betting that interest rates and inflation will rise. They're even calling it Trumpflation. Now, the key point here is that bond prices fall when interest rate and inflation expectations rise. So Trumpflation is basically a bond market's worst enemy. Bonds are basically a promise to repay debt at a certain point in the future with a stream of interest payments. And if the U.S. wants other countries to lend it more money, it will have to raise the interest payments. Don't forget, we've been living in a low interest rate environment ever since the financial crisis. In fact, in many parts of the developed world, deflation has been the big fear. And this bond reversal has big implications for the way in which money flows across the world. Well, joining us now from Kuala Lumpur is Jamil Ahmad. Jamil's the Vice President of Development and Chief Market Analyst with London-based Forex Time. Jamil, good to have you with us uh, on the program. Um, what's your take on the, the Trump thump then, this $1 trillion US loss in the bond market? Uh, thank you very much for having me. So basically, following on from what is going to be known as a political shock, and follows a trend of an unbelievable and unpredictable 2016, we've had market volatility at intense levels across the board. So no matter whether you're monitoring global bonds, treasuries, equity markets, or currencies, we've had a strong level of market volatility. Global bonds have sunk. They've lost over 1.6 trillion since the night of the election. So basically we're just witnessing a lot of volatility. It's calmed down a little bit more now, but yes, global bonds have been the major loser. 
So, Jamil, is this the end of bonds? Are they now so unappealing that nobody wants to put their money there? Basically, on the back of this expectations that the Federal Reserve will be raising U.S. interest rates, we've got 100% expectations for December, and that's quite remarkable. Global bonds are looking much lower. But what we need to do now is dissect the hypothetical responsibilities or possibilities that can Donald Trump really deliver on his campaign promises. After all, he hasn't actually been officially inaugurated yet, and he will not be for two more months. You talked about it briefly in, in your first answer, Jamil. If the money isn't going into bonds at the moment, where is it going? Yeah. It's definitely leaving the bond markets and it's going into two different asset classes. We've got the US dollar and the US equity markets. Beginning with the equity markets, basically these tax cuts are seen as very positive towards corporations and improving their profitability. As a result of this, the US stock markets are reaching record highs. They closed at new record highs yes, uh, just yesterday. The dollar's at a 12-year high, and basically it has taken place as the undisputed king of the currency markets. It doesn't matter whether you are a um, emerging market currency or a major currency, such as the British pound, against the dollar, you are currently receiving a punch. You talk about the, the, the strength of the dollar, all the political uncertainty in, in Europe. What I want to know is, is what all of this means for, for the rest of the world, you know, in particular emerging markets. Well, basically, what we've seen is a period of risk off and less investor attraction towards the emerging markets. Now, the emerging market currencies have been completely walloped against the dollar in recent weeks. Um, some emerging market currencies are hitting new record lows. Other emerging market currencies are dropping 8 9%. Now, basically, this combination of a stronger dollar and increased U.S. interest rate outlook is seen as negative to capital outflows. So basically there's concerns that capital will be leaving these economies. All of this is pretty technical, I, I think I understand. But what does it mean for the man in the street, the, the, the ordinary person like <laughs> me, or, or the person watching the programme? Well, well, basically, if you want to buy products from the United States, or if you want to visit the United States, your holiday or your product has just got a little bit more expensive. Um, it, it's a dollar drive basically throughout the currency markets. The dollar is getting significantly stronger and no matter whether you're carrying British pounds or Malaysian ringgits, because I'm in Malaysia today, you're witnessing your currency weaken against the dollar. And what I would say is there's a lot of concerns that Donald Trump's going to bring in these protectionist trade policies, which are seen as very negative towards the emerging market currencies. But what the markets haven't quite understood yet or it hasn't been factored in expectations, that for Donald Trump to bring in protectionist trade policies and for him to make sectors such as manufacturing and other services competitive again, he actually needs a weaker dollar. So once the dust has settled and once Donald Trump has officially been inaugurated, this dollar rally might not be lasting that much longer. We've got maybe two months, then we need to reassess. To the average man of the street, Maybe you have opportunities to travel elsewhere, but you might be finding your holidays in the United States a little bit more expensive, just to sum up. Terrific. Jamil, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Uh, that's uh, Jamil Ahmed there in Kuala Lumpur. Now, situated on the edge of the Sahara, historically this city was a famed final trading stop before a vast ocean of desert, and a trip to Timbuktu used to be on the to-do list for tourists to northern Mali. Until, that is, fighters linked to al-Qaeda took over five years ago. Mohamed Val reports. The waterfalls of Lafia Bugu near Mali's capital Bamako used to be a tourist destination of choice. Now it's become marred by the fear of violence. Apart from the occasional visit by mostly non-European foreigners based in Bamako, tours like this one are all but completely abandoned. Mali has lots of tourist attractions such as the city of Timbuktu with its precious manuscripts, the city of Bandiagara where locals still preserve their ancient way of life, and these waterfalls for instance. But all of this has been affected by violence. Since the takeover of northern Mali by armed groups in 2012 and the subsequent French military intervention, the country has faced continuous instability. In 2013, two French journalists were killed outside the city of Kidal in the north after being kidnapped. 
In November last year, an attack by an Al-Qaeda offshoot on the Radisson Hotel in Bamako killed at least 20 people, including nine Western nationals. The risk of violence in the north drove not only tourists away, but also thousands of civilians who became refugees in neighboring countries. Timbuktu's legendary libraries and ancient manuscripts were looted, its great mosques vandalized, its modern hotels left in ruins, and its annual art festival, which used to draw hundreds of international visitors, is no longer organized. Tourism doesn't exist in northern Mali anymore. We have some remnants of it in the south due to some tourists who go first to neighboring countries and some of them drive to Bamako, but they never go north of Segu. We cannot speak of tourism in the north for several years to come. Even in the capital Bamako, tourism is no longer a sustainable business. Places like the Tomas Center used to be a hub for the lovers of Tuareg culture and art. Now its activities are halted, its artifacts are covered with dust. Our artists no longer make any income. We cannot promote their work anymore. Handicrafts no longer sell because there are no tourists. We even used to provide the best cuisine from the north. Now all of that is a thing of the past because no one is here to buy it. The latest peace agreement between the Malian government and the rebels in the north still awaits full implementation and foreign armed groups still operate in the country. All signs that point to the unlikelihood of Mali regaining its position as a tourist destination in the near future. And finally this week, bicycles are making a comeback in China. They used to be the main mode of transport, but fell out of favor when car ownership surged as people became wealthier. Now, though, attitudes are changing, as our China correspondent Adrian Brown found out in the city of Hangzhou. On China's busy streets, cyclists are often squeezed for space. All big cities have dedicated cycle lanes, but even here, there are intruders. In the eastern city of Hangzhou, though, pedal power is fighting back, helped by smart card technology or an app in your phone. Hangzhou now boasts the world's largest bicycle sharing program, with almost 80,000 available for hire. The first hour is free. It is the internet era now, so we are trying to make our service easier to customers through the internet. For instance, you can hire a bike using a smart card or a QR code on your phone. We plan to add more bike stations and bikes in the next five years. The scheme is a response in part to worsening traffic congestion and the pollution that comes with it. All of which were virtually unknown just three decades ago when the bike, and not the car, was king. Back then, China was still a relatively poor country, but bikes were cheap. By the early 90s, though, Chinese people had started to become more prosperous. And what better way of showing off your wealth than to own a car? For a time, it seemed, the day of the bike was numbered. But eight years ago, a decision was made to revive bike usage. That's when China's first bike-sharing scheme began here in Hangzhou. Transportation planners had begun to realize that the further a commuter lived from a bus or subway stop, the less likely they were to use public transport, which is where the bike came in. Every metro station has a bike station, so it's very convenient to use. For long distances, I take the metro, then transfer to the public bike for the short trip. Bike sharing has come a long way since the Dutch hit on this utopian concept more than half a century ago. Today, surveillance cameras are trained on every one of Hangzhou's 2,801 bicycle stations. It may look sinister, but officials insist that such monitoring enables them to know when to replenish busier bike stations. No one, of course, believes that bike sharing will be a quick fix to China's chronic pollution. But a recent survey showed that 30% of commuters were now using these bikes as part of their journey. And that, say officials, is progress. Time for us to get on our bike. That's our show for this week. But there's uh, more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. Uh, you can also get in touch with us by tweeting me at A Finnegan. And do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, please. Or you can drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. 
And that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. In Doha, I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here. Thanks for being with us. The news is next on Al Jazeera. I'll see you again. Bye for now.